Hello everyone and welcome back to day eight of Bitwise where we built the software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, today I'm going to jump right in where we left off, but um, first uh, I should mention that the approach that I ended up implementing on stream for day seven uh, turned out to not work in the end. And so I actually went back to an algorithm that I had originally tried over the weekend uh, and which I had deemed to have some fatal flaws. And with the benefit of doing, you know, whatever the, the second implementation, the one we did on Monday, I realized uh, the simple ingredient that was missing to make it simple and workable. Uh, and so on Monday, I actually went through and um, and uh, and just uh, made it work. And, and I have the code to show you and demo in a second, but I do wanna talk about why the approach we took on Monday won't actually work. So if you recall, I actually don't have the code anymore because I deleted it. Um, but if you recall, the basic algorithm was to do a very superficial um, ordering of the dependency graph. And when I say very simple, what I mean is we didn't really do, you know, we didn't do type checking and inference and constant expression evaluation or any of the stuff uh, that, that I'm doing now, we basically just walked the graph in a sort of superficial way, looking for references to types and other declarations, and just did an ordering based on that. And I realized that there's a bunch of case after the stream, I realized there's even some simple cases where that breaks. Uh, and, and let me write one example here. So um, the the example was, suppose you have, uh, you have some type T, and then you have a variable uh, a pointer variable like this, um, and then you have a constant which is like this. So this is almost C code, so you can hopefully understand it. There's a struct here, it doesn't really matter what's inside. Um, I mean, you, you can imagine there's an int if it makes you feel better. Um, and then there's a variable P which has pointer type, so it's not a value of type T, it's a pointer to T. Um, and then we have a const which um, is, a, is, a si is, is set to the size of uh, d ref p. So this this is really equivalent to this if you think about it. Um, it's equivalent to the size of t, which I guess in this case is just the size of int. Um, and the thing that that that, 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 that this breaks is um, if you think about it. Um, if you think about it with this stuff, um, and I guess maybe a more interesting case would be this, which I think is the one from, yeah, I think this was the one specifically that I th that I used as a torture test. If you look at this here, this is obviously a contrived example, but it's the kind of thing that really should work if you handle things properly. Um, but basically, even though P references T, because it references it, it references it through a pointer type, in C terms, this would be like, you know, you can do this, right? Um, this is totally fine in C. Um, and so this would be something like this. Um, and then you could do something like this. Um, and so this is totally fine in, 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 in C. You know, we can have we can have this declaration of P before T is, has been defined as a complete type. So we can forward declare T, and then until it's actually defined, T is only what's called an incomplete type, and this is totally valid. Uh, and, and just if you think about what this means, um, this is the size of a pointer, but the size of a pointer is the same regardless of the underlying type. So it's always, you know, four or eight, for example, and it's 32 bit and 64 bit. But anyway, the reason this wouldn't work with the kind of shallow dependency uh, walk we did uh, the other day is that uh, that basically assumes a kind of naive transitivity where uh, this thing here forces a dependency on T, uh, Right, and uh, and even if we had some special case where we say, well, because it's a pointer, we don't really need a dependency. The thing that makes it tricky with that naive approach we took is that here um, we, de we 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 seem to depend on p, but p itself does not really depend on t being a complete type, but this thing does, and so the whole idea of transitivity really fails. 
if, if you think about it, because P does not depend on T uh, and sort of superficially N depends on P, but really not, but not really it depends on the fact that T is a complete type and so on. So anyway, um, this, this sort of case breaks with that approach we took. And it made me, but it was very good that I that I tried it because it made me realize what the missing ingredient was to make my original approach that I tried over the weekend and that I found uh, problematic in that case. And that's really that we need some we needed some equivalent of the notion of incomplete types in C, which is you know kind of what I just talked about here. Um, so let me jo jump over into the code and show you how this actually works. Um, so what we do now. And let me just, uh, there's like 500 lines of code, so I'll go through it quickly. But uh, the, the way things work now is, you know, you parse a bunch of declarations corresponding to a package. Then you install entities for each of them. An entity is basically, um, it, it, I mean, it corresponds to sort of a, a, a package level binding. Um, and so it has an associated name, it has a kind, uh, so it can be like a var const func type or an enum constant. It has a state, which which is this ternary state that we talked about uh, originally for, uh, for for dealing with, um, you know, kind of detecting cycles and so on. Uh, and then there's associated declaration. Um, and in the case where something, you know, denotes a type, there's an associated type. And uh, optionally, there's a value associated with it if it's a const uh, entity. So that, that we install for each declaration, we install an entity, and then we go through and we just uh, we resolve everything. And uh, let me show you how that works. When you try to resolve an entity, to, uh, it first does the um, kind of the cache check that we uh, that we talked about uh, previously, where if it's already been resolved, then we don't need to do anything. Uh, all the values of that entity struct are already filled in as they should be. Uh, otherwise, if it's in the midst of being resolved, as we try to resolve it again, it means that somehow we wound up with the cyclic dependency, and so that's uh, a fatal error for now. Um, otherwise, we try we, we start trying to resolve it, and then depending on what kind of entity it is, we either try to resolve a type, a variable, or a const. But right now, we don't handle enums. Uh, and then finally, having done that, um, returning from that recursive resolution of the declaration associated with the entity, we say this entity is now resolved and we push it on the list of ordered entities. So, so this ordered entities uh, list is ultimately what will contain the sorted uh, list of things in the package. And so let's see what these things do. These are actually quite simple. Um, for a var, for example, um, to resolve a var declaration, you know, uh, if there's an explicit type, then we try to resolve the type spec. If there's an explicit uh, initializer expression, then we try to resolve that expression. And um, resolving a type spec uh, is just kind of you know, transforming the syntactic uh, type spec into a semantic type. And the type here is the thing we implemented on Friday, which is this uh, interned representation of a type where you know, different, uh, different types have a unique in-memory identity. So a pointer to int is always in turn to exactly the same memory location. So you can just do pointer compares to do structural comparisons. So that's what that does. And, and if you look at it, um, it's a very simple case analysis. If you have a type name, then we recursively go and resolve it. And this this is the one of the main things that recurses back into the resolve entity. Um, so you can see it tries to look it up in the symbol table. And assuming there's a binding there, we recursively go back into resolve uh, identity in this entity, which is the thing we were looking at a second ago. Um, but then for the other cases, we just recurse, recursively resolve the, the type spec for those component parts and build the corresponding type. So if it's a, a, a pointer type spec, we build a pointer type. Um, of course, first res recursively resolving the element uh, type spec and so on. And in the case of an array, it's more interesting because we not only have to resolve the element type, but we also have to actually compute uh, the array size, as a con which requires constant expression evaluation. So, so you can see how this approach we're taking here, which I've determined is basically necessary uh, after thinking about all these edge cases, is the, th the all-in-one resolver I was originally planning on doing, which does everything sort of at once. It does type checking, type inference, uh, constant expression evaluation, and ultimately resolving the order of declarations, uh, the logical order of declarations required by the dependencies. It does does that all in one, sort of uh, intermingled, which which leads to this fairly simple approach uh, where 
really the only the only piece of the code that has to think explicitly about the whole ordering issue is resolve entity itself and everything else is just written like you would write it in a non order independent uh, system like if you're writing a c compiler where obviously declarations are ordered you would have you or you could you could write code that's exactly like this it would look almost 99% the same um, and so that way this really isolates the ordering stuff to a few functions rather than just proliferating it everywhere. So that's kind of the idea. You know, you can see if you're doing it for a func, you have to resolve each of the parameter types and the return type, and then you build a, a function type at the end of all that. Um, and, and, and so that's for vars. And um, uh, yeah, so let me, so, so that's an extension of what I talked loosely about before. Let me talk about the new ingredient that made all of this work, which is the notion of an incomplete type, much like C. Um, so originally, oh, so let me talk about how it works now. Um, if you if you remember back to what we did on uh, on Friday, we had all these different constructor functions, most of which do interning to or hash consync to ensure this unique representation of a given type kind of type. Um, and then we also had corresponding functions for constructing structure types and union types. Um, and so that, that part has changed a little bit. The way things work now is every time you have a structure type or a union type, um, they're always initially created as incomplete types in the symbol table. So as soon as you install the, a declaration, as soon as you install the entity for a declaration that's a structure or a union type, it's ne you never try, you always immediately create an incomplete type that corresponds to that structure union. Um, and th that's just a separate kind, kind flag, you know, called incomplete. Uh, and we link that back to the entity. And but so it's so so this is how it starts out. You have the declaration, you create a kind of a placeholder type that's an incomplete type, and you link it to the entity. And then the idea is that at some future point in time, you may need to actually complete the the type. Like for example, if you if if you're in a context that needs to know the size of the struct. You, you know, just like in C, if you have an incomplete type, you can't take the size of it. Um, you need to know the complete type. Uh, and so that that's now how these functions work. They don't create a new type. They just kind of upgrade an incomplete type to a complete type of, a, you know, that's either a structure or a union, everything, everything set up correctly. But otherwise, this code here is the same stuff we had before, but now the difference is it assumes you put it, you give it a type that's in the process of being completed, and then... Um, and then it actually com completes it. But it tries to delay that as, 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 as late as possible. So it's a kind of a lazy evaluation approach. It tries to delay it, to delay it as late as possible. Um, and so this really means that there's two kinds of, you know, resolving or completing going on. There's the declaration level resolving, which is what we were doing before. And now there's also the type level stuff for just for structs and unions, where they start out as incomplete and then eventually can become upgraded to complete based on this demand driven lazy valuation approach. Um, and so there's a function called complete type, which is kind of like the equivalent of resolve entity, but for types. And so you can call this on a type. Um, and you know, for something like a type def or just a primitive type, if, or you know, something like that, if you call it on it, it doesn't really do anything because those are never incomplete in the first place. So this all really only does something in two cases. One is that um, it tries to complete a type that's already in the process of being completed. So this is another case where we have to do cycle detection. So for example, if you do something like um, if you do something like this, um, you know, this is obviously not you know this would be like i mean maybe to make it even more explicit if you imagine trying to calculate the size of this thing this would be infinitely large if you even could make sense of it at all because it would sort of be like you know its size would be size of int plus uh i mean this is even assuming you you assume it's meaningful but like it would be something like this right if you think of the type of the size of the equation for this thing so this is to detect cases like that where when you try to complete an incomplete type um, and in the process of completing it, you somehow wind back, recursing back to yourself. It kind of means you have this kind of value level cycle. And so that's what that catches. And so that's a separate notion of cycling from the from the entity resolving. And that's the, the part that I missed initially is that those two things cannot be done in the same way. Um, 
at least I, I still haven't found a way to do that. But but doing it this way turns out to be really simple. And so really all, all you do when you uh, try to complete a type is that, um, you know, let's see, what do we do? It can only be a struct or a union, so it's an aggregate in any case. Uh, th then we actually go in, uh, we resolve the, um, we resolve all the parts of the aggregate uh, declaration, like all the field types, and we make sure that those fields are not only resolved but completed. Because you know, if you have a field, like for example in this case here, um, when you try to complete T, it ends up completing itself, right? Because of this field, and so that's what would end up triggering this completion cycle. Um, but anyway, you build up that list of field types, fully completed field types, and then depending on whether it's a structure or a union, you go and actually fill in. Uh, the data to match. And then having done that, you push it on the list of ordered entities because now that whole thing has been uh, fully resolved and completed. So anyway, I know that's a little bit complicated. Um, and I, I guess I didn't feel my explanation was 100% was clear, but uh, hopefully uh, you can look at the code and, and, uh, and combine with, I can also answer questions about it afterwards. Um, but, but this ended up being actually pretty simple. And really, like I said, the missing ingredient was the notion of an incomplete type, much like C. Um, so yeah, so that was it for the type stuff, which was really the complex part. But let me also talk about the expressions because you need to know about, to resolve types, you need to know about constant expressions and, and expression types and stuff like that. Um, and so that's what the resolve expression function is responsible for. Um, the resolve expression function takes an AST node for the expression and returns ultimately this resolved uh, expression struct, which contains a type because as a result of resolving an expression, you learn its type uh, and also some additional data like is this thing an L value? So can it go on the left hand side of an assignment and can, and, and can, you, de uh, can you take the address of it and so on? Uh, and also, is it a constant? And if it's a constant, what is its value? Um, so all of these things are necessary for uh, the resolution process. And then if you look at um, if you look at this resolve function, I mean this is it will turn out to be pretty straightforward. But for example, if you have a, a literal, you just uh, make a resolved expression uh, that, that has that uh, literal value as its constant value. Um, if you try to resolve a, a name expression, it has to go do a uh, a name resolution, uh, so we get back an entity, and in an expression context, the only two kinds of entities that are uh, that are allowed for now, I guess we also functions should be allowed, but that's not uh, implemented right now, it is either a var or a const, and if it's a var, then we have an L value, and we know what type it is because it's already been resolved um, recursively through this function. And if it's a const, uh, we know right now it's assumed that all the constants are integers just for, for simplicity. It's going to change, obviously. Um, and we also know its value because, again, the entity has been fully resolved after returning from this function. And so we just create a resolved expression with that constant value. Um, and sort of the same thing for the other cases. Um, right now, for binary operators, I just implemented addition because basically all the operators are parallel and I just wanted to have sort of a vertical slice of this stuff but you can see how it works um, so for a binary operator we obviously have two operands and we recursively resolve those and then for now we only allow ints so we say you know the, the left type has to be an int and the right type has to match the left type um, and then there's two cases depending on whether we have a constant expression result or not if both the left and right operands are constants then we have as a result also a constant and we can actually do the constant expression evaluation here otherwise we have an r value um, and uh, you know the r value type is the left operands type um, and then for unary i have two cases implemented so far um, one which is uh, dereference so obviously unary uh, operator has one operand so it resolves that uh, takes its type and then checks in the case of a deref, it has to make sure that's a pointer type. And if it is a pointer type, then you return an L value corresponding to what you get by stripping away the pointer part of the type and just leaving the element type. So, you know, if you do, uh, you know, if you have, let's see, uh, if you have this 
and you do uh, something like this, um, then you know that's not uh, p. Then this is going to have uh, small t is going to have type large t, right? Or x is going to have, let's say x. X is going to have type t. So that's the logic there, and it's an and it's an L value because when you dereference something, you can assign through it, so it's an L value. Uh, and this is for taking addresses. If you want to take the address of something, it has to be an L value. You can't, for example, take the L value. Uh, you can't take the address of say 42, the number 42. But if you have a var, um, you can take the uh, the address of that, and so that. The, the pointer value for that is an R value, but then you can dereference it to get a L value. So that's the idea. Um, okay, there was a whirlwind tour of that in no particular order. Let me show you how it ends up working. Uh, here's a bunch of declarations. Um, the I guess the, the interesting thing here is to understand what are real dependencies or, and what are not uh, in view of all this uh, uh, incomplete type stuff. So let me just show you what it resolves to in the end. Um, so let me just put them next to each other. So this is the, the source order in the code, and this is the resolved order. And you can see that even though p references t, uh, the var p declaration is actually at the very top. And the reason is this thing can work with t as an incomplete type, just like in C. Um, and you, but you can see, for example, n has to come after uh, after p because it actually, uh, well, it references it. Um, and um, but 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 interestingly, note that n you know n doesn't need to know the size of t. It only needs to know the size of t star, which is you know doesn't require knowing t. So it's okay for for n to work with the incomplete type p uh, t as 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 uh, you know, both, both P and N can work with the incomplete type T. Um, but then there's stuff down here like U. So U dereferences P, which means that U has type T. And so it actually needs to know, uh, it, T needs to be a complete type by the time that, that U is declared. And so that's why you see now T comes after and then U comes um, and so on. And, 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 you know, small T is a manifest a variable of that type and so on. Um, but anyway, so you can kind of see that it resolves all these dependencies correctly, uh, and in the process of doing that, it also has to compute, you know, has to compute types. It has to do constant folding and all this other stuff. So um, right now, I'm not printing all the resolved info in terms of the types and the ray bounds and whatnot, but we can look at it in the debugger. So for example, suppose we want to say see how big how big this uh, array called A actually is. Um, So that's T. So T is a type and it's fully resolved. And if you look at the type, it's a struct. It has size 36. Um, I mean, we can dive into it more. So it's a struct, has one field, um, A. A is an array and that's where all the size comes from. If you look at Sorry. If you look at, if you go down here, it has nine elements. Oh yeah, it has nine elements because the the size of the array is is n, and n is one plus size of p. P is a pointer, uh, so it has size eight plus one is nine. So that makes sense. And then um, that that's going to get multiplied by the size of the element type, which is four, and so. Uh, four times nine, uh, you know, four times eight is 32 plus four is 36. So that, that works out that way. So you can see, I mean, I'm not going to go through all the cases, but you can kind of see that it's not just ordering them. It's actually figuring out the full types, computing the sizes, uh, all of that stuff. Um, and you can see there's some cases here, like, um, let's look at this for the type inference. So t dot a, it's resolving that, uh, and it's giving you and you know it's taking the the address of that and assigning it to r. So if you find r in this array, it's going to be 
somewhere down here. You can see it's a resolve variable. Um, if you look at the type, it's a pointer to, that actually looks, oh no, that is right. It's a pointer to an array. So yeah, that looks right. So anyway, um, I realized that was a potentially confusing uh, tour of this stuff, but um, the, the, the nice thing about it ultimately is that um, if you look, for example, at all the expression resolving code, there's really nothing here that has to be cognizant of the fact that it's doing kind of on-demand uh, on demand resolving of all the different dependencies. All of that stuff is really isolated to the resolve entity function. So all of these things are written much like they would be in a order dependent C style uh, type checker type resolver. And um, Really, the main thing you have to do is you have to make sure to call this complete type function before you do something that involves, say, say the size of a type. Um, and this size of function doesn't really do anything magical. It's just an accessor. I'm just, I was using it for debugging to make sure that I caught all the cases in my code where I might not have been calling complete type before accessing the type. So this is just a sanity check. This is probably going to go out in the eventual code. But um, when I was making this work, it was convenient to have this thing. That, that would uh, that would catch misuses uh, because I originally had it without the type completion and so I had to reinstate it and make sure I caught all the cases. But um, but yeah, you can see how resolve expression is basically how you would write it in any old uh, type checker. Uh, so it's doing a case analysis, it's recursively resolving any sub expressions and then it's validating after having resolved those sub expressions, it's validating that everything fits together as they should according to the language semantics. Um, and of course, we've only implemented a small slice of all the operators we need, but most of them are going to be the same. Um, and um, before I go further, I do want to do sort of a midstream Q&A because I realized this stuff is maybe complicated and I didn't do the best job explaining it. So uh, before I start extending it uh, with some, you know, doing some live coding, I, I, I want to catch uh, some, some basic questions and, and make sure that people are not 100% lost. So uh, let me look at some questions. Um, someone's, someone's asking if I'm recording videos, you can watch them later. Yeah, they're all on YouTube. All right. Um, let me just scroll up. I, I felt like as I was explaining this, this was needlessly confusing, but, um, I'm, I'm, maybe it wasn't as confusing as I thought it was. And if, if I misexplained anything, please ask questions and I will do a better job, hopefully explaining it a second time. Um, All right. Does this make sense at all? R really, like I said, the main thing that made this work that, that wasn't working before for me was the whole notion of incomplete types. And in hindsight, it's kind of an obvious change because it's pretty much exactly what C does. Um, the main difference from C, of course, is that if you try to do things like compute size of an incomplete type, C is just going to say, you can't do that. And the difference is for us, we will actually try to complete the type on demand. And then only if it turns out there's some cycle that makes that impossible, do we actually print an error. Um, but otherwise the whole notion and the way we use incomplete types is very much like C. Um, someone's asking if I can push the code I just explained. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to push. I can push it right now. Actually, most of it is on GitHub, but there's been a few changes, so I can push it right now. Um, while I wait for more questions, I'll just make sure I didn't completely break anything. Yeah, I mean, you can look at the code as it is right now. I don't think there's been any substantial changes. No, I mean, I'll push it. Um, let me just verify it didn't load things on Linux. All right. The, but yeah, so, all right, one question. 
Okay, let's see. Someone's saying, uh, one question when where you asserted on L value only expert and you return a token R value. I think it was a deref. Oh, so it must be here. I'm not sure what you meant by the assert. But yeah, so when you try to do a deref, this is called token mall, but it's, you know, it, it really just means this thing here. Um, it verifies that you have a pointer type because those are the only things you can dereference. Uh, and then the result of that is an L value. Um, so you can, you know, you can do this, for example. Um, and when you take the address of something, that itself is, is not an L value, but of course you can do something, you can do stuff like this, right? All right, if there's no other questions, maybe I'll just take a second to figure out what would be a good thing to work on next. Um, there's a bunch of cases we're not handling. One thing I, I, I thought would be good to handle first is we have these untyped uh, or implicitly typed um, compound literals where you can write stuff like, you know, you, you can write stuff like uh, vec2, one, com one comma two, uh, you, can do, you can do this. But you can also do well. This is for initialization, so it's it maybe looks simpler. But you can do stuff like this. But you can also inside a function, though we don't have that right now. Um, if you had a function and it was something like this, you could do this as well. And all of these cases depends on the fact that um, when you're doing your type resolution, there is some sort of expected type that we pass down to the resolve procedures, and then when we see a um, when we see an implicitly typed compound literal, you basically want to say, well, you're only allowed to have an implicitly typed compound literal if there's an expected type in that context. And then you have to validate that, of course, um, that all the fields and their types and so on actually match, which would be the same in any case. Um, but I thought it would be good to do compound literals maybe as the next thing in the type resolver, uh, if there are no other questions. All right. Um, Okay, so let's see about that. Um, so I think that would really just be, um, I guess, this case here. I'm just going to add another function. Um, And so let me just remind myself of what those fields are called. Compound, oh, that's down here. Um, so this thing is optional, but for now, let's just say it's mandatory. Um, and um, so we have a bunch of these argument expressions and each of those is going to um, let's call them resolved resolved expressions and um, let's see now the, the, fir the first thing we have to do is actually resolve the compound type and um, and then I think we can just walk it in lockstep with the other stuff Is that the best way to do it, I wonder? No, we might as well, let's see, because once we're done here, um, well, I guess we don't really need true constant expressions for compound types. So maybe let's think about what we're actually gonna return at the end of it. I think at the end of it, we're just gonna say resolved R value of that type. So really the main thing we have to do is just, we don't really have to compute any 
thing to return, I think we mostly just have to validate uh, the types, um, I think. So if you go through these, I guess the, maybe one thing to do would be to say if um, you're allowed to have fewer initializer arguments than the, um, oh, and let's see, and this has to be um, if type kind is not equal to, um, let's just do say structs only for now, and then we'll do, um, we need to do arrays as well, I guess, right? Um, and so let's say this is, um, And I'm just going to double assert it just now. Let's not do that. Uh, and then, so that means we have this. And let's check it against aggregate num fields. Um, these are shitty error messages, by the way. But I just want to fill something in. I don't want to think too hard about what what extra information to provide or whatever. Um, and then we go through these and we want to check. We want to ch check. Oh, and the other thing, so this is a good example. Um, we actually have to complete this type. Um, and let's see here. And then we want to check that. Um, Let's see, the field should be and this has to match the um, This is like the shittiest type errors ever, but something like this. Does that make sense? So we take this, we resolve the explicit compound type, um, make sure it's complete, make sure it's a struct for now, verify that we don't have too many fields in the literal, um, and then go through them in order resolve them so we get a type and then we check that the types are the, the expected type. So let's see if that works. And for now I'll just, I need to figure out what the key binding is. I thought they had a control slash binding. Just comment that out. Okay, so let's say we have um, we have some struct vector, and it has two fields. Um, then if I do var v vector one comma two, that should work. And that did work. But um, for example, if I had uh, some pointer type here and I did this, that should not work. Right, so that didn't work. And uh, I should be able to provide fewer arguments than required, in which case, you know, the implication is there will be zero filled. But if I provide too many, then we'll just get an error.
Right, too many fields. Um, why did I end up in this file? All right, so that seems reasonable. Let's try to do the same kind of thing, but for uh, for arrays. So what's that resolve? Expert compound. Guess I should also be able to use it with unions. Um, Um, yeah, no, I was trying to think about whether I need to resolve these types, but I actually don't because all we care about here is identity and even incomplete types have proper identity. That's kind of one of the main reasons they exist. So we don't need to do complete types here. Uh, and then we just have to check that um, the array element type is as expected. Again, these are shitty errors, but now is not the right time to think hard about usability. Um, all right, so I think that's it. Let's see if that works. And we should also check with the union. Um, and a pointer. So we'll say there's an int field and there's a pointer field. Um, Say like this, and then um, oh, let's say this is a union. This is not super useful right now. We need to do name fields very soon, but um, I haven't even implemented that in the parser, even though it's pretty easy. But let's just do it, kind of, as a meaningless test here. So. Um, Do it like this. Let's see if that works. Okay, we need to make, we need to make sure this actually, like if we reverse the fields, for example, this shouldn't work. Right. Um, And then let's do the same thing for arrays. So if we have some array of three ints, we should be able to do this. Expressure compound, oh right, that thing is no longer um, resolve expert compound. It's really only valid here. Um, Uh, 
Interesting. Oh, right. This stuff all has to be moved in. Oh, that's true. Yeah, so, so I, we can't do array literals until we have expected types. Um, that's interesting. So let's just do expected types. Um, right, right, right. All right, let's um, let's put this back up and uh, table this stuff for now, and then do the expected uh, type propagation, and then we will return to that in a sec. Well, actually, that's not true. Hang on. Um, but it can't be, yeah, it can't be, mm, no, so this is, uh, this is correct. So we do that and all right, so that actually does work. We just have to, I forgot we have, we can do that for array types as well. So we just have to do, let's do this. Uh, we have to do like that. I think that's right. Okay. Okay, so that seems to do the trick. Uh, it seems to pass in any case. So let's see, if we provide fewer, that should work. Um, but if we provide too many, it should not work. And it does not. Um, all right. And we can also verify if we do something like this, that the types unify. As soon as we, uh, as soon as we remove that excess element, yep. All right. So that basically works. Um, let's do the expected type stuff. That would be fun to do now, I guess. Um, so. The idea behind expected types is that everything, including um, including the top level function, well, let's see here. So expected type, it's, it doesn't actually verify for in general that the types match, um, but it's really just a hint, I guess. So you so the resolve function itself does not have to actually do the type checking because I think you usually want like for example if you're doing something like a var uh, declaration this thing here could pass down an expected type like it would it would do this um, but it would still do the checking here because you want to do the type checking in a context where it knows what's being type checked um, like the var can say, hey, this is the variable that has the type that's not expect as expected. You don't want to actually push that in. So, so this argument here for the expected type is really just, um, I, I guess, mainly really for compound literals and maybe nothing else. Um, 
And so maybe all we have to do is pass it in here. And maybe there's other cases where we want to get fancier, but for now, I think that would be fine to just push it in here. Um, so let's see. Um, so basically, um, let's see. So we're not required to have an explicit type now. Um, but we can't have both. Let's see. If we don't have an expected type and we don't have um, an explicit type, Um, and then here, I guess you want to say, let's just call this type. Let's so, so what's the right logic? What's the right way to express it? I guess we'll say, um, if there is a compound type, um, and it is not equal to the expected type. Is it the right? So can we, let's see here. So at this point, we know that if they are both provided, then they match. And so really only, um, let's see, if there's an expected type, then we use that. Otherwise, we resolve it. Okay, I just disconnected from OBS, so let me just wait for that to catch back up. All right, looks like it's reconnected. Yeah, I disconnected for a second. I'm just uh, fixing up these call sites. All right, let's see. So why is this?
So if there is a compound type provided, then we resolve it. And um, and if they're there, if they're there, there is also an expected type, and we don't match it, we have to error out. And then here, um, I guess let's just call this. Um, something like this. All right, let's make sure existing stuff didn't break. That seems good. Um, then if we move, for example, this to the left-hand side, that will maybe now work. It appears to do so. Um, let's move this to the very top and then step through the code just to make sure it does something reasonable. <clears throat> so this is compound, it has no explicit type, but there is an expected type, which is the array type. So it just uses that, it completes the type, and then it descends into the array case. There should be three of these. We're done. And we are off. All right, so that looks reasonable. And we can check that um, this also works with the structure types. So if you do this, for example, that should work. And it does. Just gonna put that back. Yeah, maybe I'll we'll leave this, and then I'll have another one. All right, something like that. Okay. Um, the other case I want to handle for expected types is when you call a function that expects, you know, a structure type as an argument or something like that, it should be able to um, sort of use that knowledge at the call site to let you elide the explicit compound type. Um, that requires us to support function types in the resolver which we need to do anyway. So that might be a good next step. And then we'll return to compound literals and expected types and so on for, for calls. Um, so I think right now we don't handle, if you look at solve entity, we have a flag called func, but we don't really do anything with it. Um, and so we need to do something for that. And actually, let's put in a failing test just to show that it doesn't work, and then we'll make it work. And I will just comment this out for now. Um, so actually, let's keep this, and let's make a function, um, call it add, and it's going to, let's see, Return something like this. This should at least parse. Okay. Um, 
but we should not be able to resolve it. Because, yeah, we don't have a case for it. Um, so let's see, what do we need for funks? Um, I guess it's pretty simple. We just need to build um, the function type. And so what does that entail? Well, um, I guess we need an array of Ram types. Do I call them args or params? Uh, params. Let's see, so each param has what? A name and a type. I think we just do those for each of them. And uh, then we want to remember what this thing is called. Yeah, so this is called params. Params, num params. red type. Okay, so that should not work. And where were we? So, right, so we have Second declaration is this addition function. <clears throat> okay, that doesn't work because, okay, a null type spec, interesting. Oh, right. Um, did we not set a return type? In any case, I need to handle void return types, right? As we didn't set it, we need to handle that later, the whole void thing. But um, for now, this should handle it. OK, so that works. Um, let's verify that the actual um, let's verify that this thing has stuff installed correctly. So add is a func, and it's fully resolved. And uh, the type is a function type, has the right size for a pointer type, and has two parameters. Oh, so annoying. Can't see that here, right? Yeah, it doesn't know it's an array, just thinks it's a single pointer. But anyway, it looks, looks roughly right, at least. Um, and so now, let's see. When you do resolve, let's see, when you resolve an entity, so we have, what is it, resolve name? No, ex resolve expression name, that's what it's called. So we have to add a case here. And this is going to be an R value because you can't assign to pointers, uh, to functions. Um, it's going to be, yeah, it's just going to have that type. So it's basically going to act like a function pointer. Apparently I can't spell. Fortunate typo. All right. Um, all right, so then we need to support calls.
let's remind ourselves what goes into a call. So we have a bunch of arguments. Um, well, let's see. First, f first we need to resolve the actual function part. Um, what do you call this? It's called a thunk. Um, so resolve expression expr. Uh, no, expr func dot expr. There's no expected type here. And um, and so I guess we need to complete that type. Just leave it like that. Um, Oh, call, sorry. My spelling is just really great today. Okay, so resolve that part, and then we have to verify that this is actually a thunk. Um, Um, all right, and so what do we do here? We should first check that um, it's going to be such a annoying nested thing. So is it funk type funk? I mean, it's just absurd. Um, Okay, so we have to verify it's not really a short name. Um, and then once we've verified that, we can go through go through them in order. And this is where things are a little more interesting, I suppose. Uh, actually, before we get to that, let's just say by the time we're done, the really all we need to do is um, say the, the red type resolved our value of that red type. Um, but then for the type checking, we can do something more interesting because now we know the expected type from the actual function type. And so you can say, um,
resolve expression, expert call, args i. We can use thunk type thunk grams i type. It's the expected thing. We still have to validate it though. Um, Okay, it is just params i. No, oh, wait, that's the other syntactic thing. So that's resolve expression call. Is some nested, some nested accesses that make me feel a little dirty, but uh, I will think about cleaning that up later, maybe. All right, so um, let's just make sure nothing blew up, and then let's try to first, I guess, do some explicit stuff. Um, suppose you do, I don't know. Suppose you call it add with something like this. Okay, so expected. So it looks like there's just a simple parse error here. Um, all right. So that actually parses or the type checks, let's make, make sure, like if we replace this with some invalid type there that it um, will barf, right? So that doesn't work. Um, but now we should be able to do this and also have it work. That does indeed work. Um, let's see here. What are we doing on time? 9.15. So I'll go 15 more minutes and then I'll do Q&A. Or maybe I'll do Q&A in five minutes since this is a pretty good stopping point. But I will continue working on this after the stream. Um, I plan to cut off the stream and restart it for an extra stream um, and, and continue doing the rest of all these cases. But um, let me just see if this is indeed a good stopping point. Let me think about that. Um, yeah, seems pretty good. Well, one thing we're not doing right now is we're not actually traversing the function bodies and doing type checking there. But the main complexity of type checking is expressions. So the fact that we're not dealing with statements right now is, uh, you know, that's once you know how to do all the type checking and inference for expressions, the statements like assignments are almost trivial because you just need to check, you know, left hand side matches right hand side, left hand side is null value, stuff like that. Um, so basically, all the complexity of, of type checking and inference is really contained in the expressions, which we're dealing with at the top level as we uh, right now. All right. Um, so what did we handle? We handled compound literals, both struct union and arrays. And we now handled function calls, um, including providing expected types for the arguments. So we can do implicitly typed 
compound literals. Um, this, I mean, this code doesn't look as pretty as I would like it to, but I think the difference from what I was working on this weekend is that I feel I believe in the algorithm and I can see how everything will work. Uh, and so even though a lot of the code isn't how necessarily I want it to be when I, uh, when I refactor it a little bit and clean it up, um, I'm now confident in the structure. And so that could, you know, it, it makes it easy to just f fill in the blanks basically. Um, maybe I'll do Q and A now since I think we have a good stopping point here. Um, so any questions about what we just did so far? I hope what I illustrated here, the two cases we just handled, by the way, are probably two of the, I mean, I hope you saw how easy it was to do. And I also want to point out that these two cases are probably the two most complicated in the type system. I mean, they're not complicated at all, but they involve like, you know, the expected type stuff and, uh, and so on. Um, I'm sure there's some cases that are equally complicated, but this is, you know, about as bad as it gets, which is not bad at all. You, you can see it's just code. There's no magic. It's just writing code. Um, simple code. So yeah, any questions about um, the type checking and inference or the stuff we just did with compound literals, um, kind of inferred types and expected types and uh, function calls? Or is it as uh, simple uh, that you know everything is just totally obvious and no one has any questions, which would be fine too. This is particularly bad. see here um, I guess I should mention when I say type inference I mean the simple kind of type inference uh, where you don't have to really solve any fancy equations to propagate information it's really stuff like you know the, you know you have a right hand side that you assign to an implicitly typed variable like v or uh, the fancier stuff, I guess, is like you call a function and you know already the expected parameter types. And so you can use those to infer what types the argument expression should have in a call site and stuff like that. Oh, so someone's asking, what's the expected thing again? Yeah, I just mentioned it. But basically, there are certain contexts where you know uh, what type to expect. So it's not just a case where you um, you calculate the type and then at the end you can sort of check that it is, but you propagate it down first before you actually resolve the type. So for example, um, if you have, I mean, here's a really trivial example. If you if you say var v is a vector and then you have uh, uh, equals, if I now type this, um, by the time it's, it's type checking the right-hand side or doing anything with the right-hand side for the types, it already knows that it has to eventually be a vector. Uh, and so you can use that to elide the explicit uh, compound type. A compound literal type. But also in the case of calling this add function, you can see the add function declares that first argument is a vector, second argument is a vector, uh, which means that at a call site like this, you don't have to write, you know, vector, vector, you can just elide that and just provide a much more compact uh, type notation like this. So that's what the expected type uh, that's what the expected types are for. And the way it's actually implemented is that when you try to resolve an expression, you not only provide the AST node uh, for the expression that you want to resolve, but you also optionally, this can be null, you provide an expected type. Um, and most right now, most of the cases don't really care about the expected types. Uh, it's only the compound literals that really care and, um, and they actually will make use of it, um, both to validate that the expected type matches um, any given explicit type, but also then uh, using the expected type to, you know, to, to know what to validate the uh, compound literal argument expressions against. So that's kind of the idea. Um, the way C does it is, is I mean, th this is kind of an extension. So, so C does something kind of special case for this, where I'm sure everyone knows that if you have um, in C, if you do something like this, um, you know, you can write this in C. 
uh, right? And this is go this goes back. I, I don't know if it was in KNRC, probably it was, but it's certainly in NCC as of C89. Um, but the way they implemented in C is not quite as general as we are, because so even so, C99 added um, C, C99 added um, added compound literals. So in C now you can do uh, you can do this. Right, you can you can have compound literals that are explicitly typed, um, but unlike this case up here where it's kind of supported as a special case, it's not something you can do in a general expression context. Like you can't write this in C. Um, interestingly, C plus plus eleven added something which is a little bit nuts, which kind of allows for a similar syntactic effect, but it, it works rather differently because C plus plus is a lot more complex. But um, but yeah, that's sort of the idea. We want to allow for that. And so this, in our language, this not only supports this kind of case, which C already supports, um, but it also supports cases like, you know, you're calling a function or something and, uh, you know, you don't want to type out this thing all the time. You want to be able to write things more compactly. And actually the other case that's very useful is you have a local variable V. Like So, so now we know V is a vector. If you want to just write this, you can do it as well. So, or plus equals if there is, well, that doesn't work for a vector, but you see my point. Uh, any any context where you know what the what, what a given expression has to be, uh, and when you have a compound literal, you can just elide the explicit type and infer it from the context. So that's the idea. It's a very nice shorthand. It really adds up when you're doing this stuff a lot. Like one minor digression, but like one thing that's that's always been a uh, sort of a silly thing in C um, and many other languages is if you have a function f. Um, there's always this tension between do I provide a flattened set of scalar arguments or do I do, you know, something like this and um, it, where vector has, again, these two, has the same data, but sort of packed rather than unpacked. And there's actually a significant usability issue with this in C and most other languages, which is that moving from one, if you have your data as separate fields, um, before C99, you would basically have to do, you know, you would have to do something like this. If I wanted, if I had X and Y already and I wanted to call uh, F, when, when F is the second version, I would have to do something like this. Uh, in C99, you can do uh, this, which is an improvement. It's one less line and it doesn't, you know, it's a little lo less cognitive load, but this is still way too verbose compared to just this. But, you know, if you have these implicitly typed compound literals, then there's basically no syntactic overhead for having this version that takes a, um, a struct. Um, even if you, even if the data you want to give it exists as these two scalar fields. So this is one of my big motivations for it. It's just that even though it doesn't seem like a lot of, of, of typing reduction, it, it means that a lot of these functions that are where you kind of have to make a choice between packed or unpacked, um, the, the, the packed version, which is often conceptually the right version, is, is now often just is basically equally good for both cases. Uh, at least that's that's the hope. So that's one of the reasons I think doing this for function calls is actually really important. Anyway, digression. Back to the code. Alrighty. Maybe I'll wrap up the mainstream and continue on the extra stream after a, I guess, just a quick break. Um, so I'll, 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 actually, I won't stop streaming, but I'll stop recording and restart the recording. So uh, thanks for hanging out. Um, there's there's a bunch of work to do today for me to just go through all these different cases. Uh, I'm still not going to do good error messages and stuff like that, but uh, just working through all the cases is going to uh, to take a bunch of time, but it's going to be mostly straightforward work, so I figure I'd stream it if people have nothing better to do and want to hang out. So thanks for the day. I will see you for day nine the next time.